Black Label Society and Ozzy Osbourne guitarist Zach Wilde has been sporting his signature Les Paul with the bullseye for years. The guitar has become synonymous with Wilde's brand, though it was never supposed to have that bullseye design. Wilde tells Jude Gold that the guitar was supposed to have a swirl design akin to Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo film poster, but the paint job came out wrong and he didn't have time to get it redone, this is what he said. It was actually supposed to be a Vertigo, like from the Hitchcock movie Vertigo. That's what it was supposed to be, but then the buddy Max, he ended up painting the bullseye on it and I had a photo shoot that day, the rest is history. Wilde eventually had quite a few versions of the guitar done, which included the swirl design he originally wanted. Wilde said, and that one there, that's a cyclone. And then you've got the buzz saw, the vertigo, the pinstripes. You've got various things. It's like ice creams. I've got different flavors now. Realistically though, the bullseye guitar seems to have become iconic over the years, so it seems safe to assume that this was just a happy accident. Canada's Lithium magazine caught up with guitar legend Steve Vai to discuss the Generation X tour, which also features Zach Wilde, Ingve Malmsteen, Nuno Betancourt, and Tosi Inabasi. He also gave his opinion on each guitarist, this is what he said about Zach Wilde. And Zach, well, how do you not know Zach? If you're a guitar player and spend time in this business, you are going to see Zach. All the way back to when he first joined Ozzy's band he was just such an interesting color, you know? just a very open and easygoing guy. He never had a bad word to say about anybody. Whenever I would meet him it was always great. There's always this professional courtesy that is there even if you meet somebody that you don't necessarily know personally but they are in the business. But Zach just makes himself totally accessible to connecting. We've always been friends. But now, when you get together with guys like this and you live with each other, there's no secrets at sea. So you can bond. Steve Vai gave his opinion on who he thinks is the greatest guitarist of all time. Saying to Music Radar. I very rarely agree with the term best guitar player. It just seems so obscene to put something so subjective into a best category. But if I had to say there was one, I would pick Alan Holdsworth. He was unique in ways that I don't think have been discovered yet. Many musicians can be considered ahead of their time, but usually they're not. They're mainly ahead of everyone else at that time. For example, Jimi Hendrix wasn't ahead of his time, he was perfect for his time and ahead of everyone else. Alan Holdsworth was definitely ahead of his time, because it's hard to realize how great he is, not many people actually understand. It takes time for us to catch up with those that are ahead of their time. I would not be surprised if in 100 years from now, if people are still even listening to guitar, which I suspect they will be. He'll be singled out as the one alone, so to speak. The way he uses the whole tone scale is like his own baby shoes, it's so easy for him. His thought process was phenomenal. I can hear any guitar player and I know what they're doing, I might not be able to play it, but I can see it in my mind's eye. But I do not know what the fuck Alan Holdsworth was doing at all. Steve Vai said Kurt Cobain is an equally legitimate guitar master as any virtuoso out there, telling Ernie Ball. In any field, there's two basic fields of understanding your craft. One of them is the technical side. For someone like Alan Holdsworth, his desire for having a particular technique for getting his point across was different than Kurt Cobain's. They're both valid, because they're both individuals that have a particular message. So there's a technical side, but then at some point, you have to go deeper than the technique. You have to get in touch with your musical instincts. The musician added, people say someone like Kurt Cobain wasn't a great guitar player. Well, was he a virtuoso guitar player? You can argue not. But, was he effective? Try to play like Kurt Cobain, it's not that easy. Or Green Day frontman Billy Joe Armstrong. Have you ever seen him play? It's visceral, every note and every chord pops. It sounds like a giant orchestra. That's hard to do. But it was in his head and he required a particular amount of technique to follow what he was hearing in his head. For someone like myself, I wanted it all. Dream Theater guitar master John Petrucci was asked by Sterling Ball for his thoughts on Steve Vai, to which he replied, when I think about him and his guitar playing, and I've said this to my buddies hanging out when we were younger and listening to Steve Vai's music, to this day he approaches everything that he does in such a unique and original way. I don't think he'll ever run out of ideas. 
whenever I hear something new that Steve Vai plays I'm like, how come I've never heard that done before? How does he constantly innovate? The number of different approaches and techniques that he's doing on his song to get that vocalist sound, oh my god, he has the comedy in there. But he's playing stuff that's like really slinky and impossible, so then your guitar shred mind goes, alright, how do you do that? It's the imagination and the uniqueness and the innovation. The next thing that you hear him play, the next album he does or something, I guarantee there'll be something on it where you're like, I've never heard that before. It's insane. It's freaky. John also shared his thoughts on Steve Morse, saying, Steve has this way of playing guitar where for me, I want to learn what he's doing. It inspires me. I'm like, what is he playing? I have to learn those lines. I love the way he interweaves, it's kind of rock blues jazz bluegrass country and just makes these really interesting lines. And he'll do something that sounds impossible where you need the technique. My initial reaction when I hear Steve play, besides thinking, wow, this is amazing and beautiful, is, I want to learn that. I literally want to transcribe what he did and find out. Petrucci concluded, this is what I love actually about all the guys, Steve Morse does this, Steve Lukather, Albert Lee does this, all these guys play with such attitude. There's like conviction and attitude. And one of the worst things is when you hear guitar playing that's timid. I like when guitar playing is just, you're letting everything out there, playing with balls, feel and aggression. One of the things that I don't think it's sort of recognized enough is your contribution to the instrument itself, the creation of the gem guitar, mm. which uh, is that 25th anniversary this year as well? The creation 30th, 30, 30th year, sorry. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, it, it, it's, it was a total game changer, and, and many of the electric guitars that we play today owe, and people that are making guitars owe uh, a a debt of gratitude to Steve's vision on the gem. Um, could you tell me a little bit of how you created sure, yeah. it? Yeah. And I think also the point I was getting at is Tozen plays an eight string guitar, nine, right? nine string guitar. I think it's, no, eight, eight. Eight. Sorry. So, uh, anyways, you also introduced gem, also the extra string, which has become such an important part of many young players today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was very innocent because uh, when I was young, I loved strats because they had a whammy bar. Yeah. And I knew I had to have a whammy bar. <laughs> as soon as I saw what a whammy bar does when I was a kid, I said, okay, that, there I am. That's it. Uh, but I didn't like the way they sounded. They weren't rock and roll to me. You know? They weren't Led Zeppelin you know, or, or, or Black Sabbath or something like that. So uh, I loved Les Pauls. I liked the way they sounded but I couldn't sit with them. I, did, I couldn't play them very well. And I, uh, so working with Frank, Frank would get an idea for something and he would just do it. You know, he, he didn't make any excuses and he wasn't afraid to do all sorts of things to a guitar. So I, I was so young, you know, I was uh, 18 when I started working for him and then 20 when I joined the band and started touring. So I was very it was impressionable so I learned if you want to do something, you just do it, you know. So I was thinking, I'd like to build a guitar, and I wasn't quite sure what... Uh, nope. So I, there were certain things that I liked and certain things that I disliked about both uh, Stratocasters and Les Pauls, and really there wasn't any other guitar in the market that I was crazy about. Like, Telecasters were like that was like an ice pick in the forehead or something for me to play those things. They were so unrock and roll to me at the time. Little did I know a lot of the Led Zeppelin stuff was recorded on a telly, right? So um, I just started thinking, what would I like to see in a guitar? And I went to this little guitar shop in Hollywood. And at the time now, I was joining Dave Roth's band and I had this beat up uh, green, I called it the green mini, but it was a Charvel. And it was right when those, um, uh, uh, what do they call them? Uh, the mixture between like a Strat and a Les Paul. There's a terminology for it, but it's a, it's a ba basically a, a Strat style body with a whammy bar with a humbucker pickup. And that was Edward. Yes. Yeah. So he really introduced that and I said, well, that, that's smart. 
You know, you don't have to have that single coil pickup in, when you're trying to rock out. And uh, so I said, well, I know I want that. But there was a lot of other things I wanted. And I went to this little guitar builder. And the first thing I did was I drew the body. I, I thought that strats looked really nice, but they weren't that sexy, really. You know, because they kind of had uh, rounded edges and stuff. They were a little utilitarian. <laughs> so I just... I wanted something a little more kind of angular and sexy, because I think this is very sexy. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, I can't understand why these people are making guitars and they're giving you these frets, but you can't reach them. <laughs> Duh, you know. <laughs> and I wanted 24 frets. I think maybe Grover Jackson and a Strat, Super Strat. Super Strat, Super Strat. Super Strat. that's Strat. what they call them, yeah. yeah. So. so I wanted 24 frets. And I wanted to be able to, uh, this, this neck is scalloped, but on the conventional gem, the, only the first, last four frets are scalloped because it's, you can really grab the note, you know, as Ingve would say, you can really grab the note by the balls, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was a good idea to scallop them up top and, I, and it, it was totally cut away because I thought, I'm just doing this for me, you know, who's going to want this? And uh, totally easy there. Now, the, 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 one of the elements that was, was really absorbed into conventional contemporary guitars uh, was the three pickup configuration, the way that it's wired. Right. Because at the time, I didn't know it was new. It was just something I wanted, but all the research and everything uh, tells us that, yeah, that was, there was no production guitars. But these are humbuckers. And they have that, they have more of a fatter, warmer sound than single coils. These are double coils. Uh, but one of the great things about a Stratocaster that I loved is they all have single coils. And when you put two single coils on at once, like this one and that one, it's a completely different tone. It's that, it's, it's like a tubey kind of warm. The Hendrixy. The Hendrixy kind the of thing. The little wing sound. Yes. Yes. And you can't get that with, le with uh, these conventional pick uh, humbuckers at the time. So I came up with this idea to split the coil. So when I'm in this position, I get the full, full on humbucker, which I loved. And in this middle position here, it turns these two pickups on, but it, it splits the coil. So it's two single coils. So you have two single coil pickups. So you can get that sort of stratty sound. Uh, and that, that was unique at the time. And then the middle is just this. And then uh, same thing here, you split that coil. And then you got your, you know, balls to the wall here. And that was, the, that was unique at the time. I only needed one volume control, one tone control. So I got rid of the other. And I moved it down a little bit, the volume, because on strats, the, most guitars, the, the knobs seem to get in the way. But the one thing, <laughs> and then there was a couple, of, a couple of simple things, like the input jack. No guitar that I knew of at the time <laughs> had a practical input jack, because you, they had them like where you plug them in like this, straight in, like Les Pauls, and you, you step on the cable and it falls out. Like, duh. <laughs> you know, so, and Strats had it, um, and the, yeah, however they had it, it was just really easy to step on it and have it come out. So I just put it here, and never a problem, unless, of course, you're swinging around your head. And <laughs> 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 so then, but the real thing was uh, uh, the whammy bar. I love the whammy bar, and the Floyd Rose was uh, popular at the time, and it was new, and that was a godsend. Uh, well, it was hell until they put the fine tuners on it. <laughs> uh, but no, none that I had played would, would go sharp. See how, I mean, I mean, that's high. I can fret, I'm fretting those out, you know. No guitar did that. Uh, I mean, they would, you, if you set up a Strat a particular way or a Bigsby, you'd get, you get, you get, you get a little bit of that, you know, but you don't get the stratosphere. So I was looking at them saying, what, what's stopping it from doing that? And it was really just the wood on the body of the guitar. So I took a hammer <laughs> and a screw drum went, and poor, and I recorded the Attitude song. <laughs> and uh, that was, uh, from, from what I understand, that's the first floating trem. And then uh, I started, I had like four or five of these made. 
And they were just like this. You forgot the most important part. I'm getting to it. Okay. <laughs> so um, this was perfect for me. Yes. And I had like four or five of them. And I, there's a couple of st still in existence. I, I only own one now. Uh, and then I joined Dave's band, and, and obviously all the guitar manufacturers were interested in having me use their guitars. But I'm like, well, thank you. I got this one. And well, we'll, we'll make it for you. Like, that, that could be convenient, right? <laughs> so I sent it to virtually every manufacturer. And inevitably, I got back their guitar with my name on it. And I had nothing to do with what I gave them. <laughs> so I'm like, well, you know, no, this is the guitar. But then Ibanez took it. And in three weeks, they brought me back the most perfect guitar exactly to my specs. I was just stunned. And I thought, this is great. And then they said, we would like to make this a, a signature guitar and to release it to the public. And I thought, well, who, you know, I don't, it's, it's kind of quirky. I thought, okay, you know, we'll see how it goes. But I thought, there's also elements to this guitar that are very practical and might be borrowed, which is fine. That's how we all stand on the shoulders of everybody that came before us, even in manufacturing. So I thought, what can I do that's completely quirky, bizarre, that no one would really copy because it's just too obvious? I put a handle in it. <laughs> yeah. And originally I did it, uh, my, my friend Joe Despagny, he was a good, great, my best friend from Long Island, he's a guitar builder too. And he did, he did it for me in my earlier guitars. But I, I thought that it would be just great to be able to pose with it, you know. <laughs> and, and, of course, one of my favorite things is... <laughs> give the one little evil eye through the hole in the guitar. <laughs> so that's how it came about. And, and I have to tell you that I was, I'm, I was stunned at the success of this. To this day, frankly, uh, and confidentially, don't tell anybody, <laughs> 30 years, and the last, and of course you get a royalty because I designed it. I got my biggest royalty check in 30 years, last quarter. Wow. In this guitar. That's how the guitar wow. is so yeah. consistent. <laughs> and then they wanted to do, they, it, it, because it's so quirky, they wanted to, uh, Ibanez was interested in making a guitar that was much more uh, reasonably priced, so they asked me if they could make the RG guitar. Well, they already had an RG, but then they wanted to make this guitar without the handle, and that's basically the RG. And that has gone on to be the second, uh, usually third, but the second biggest selling guitar, you know, year after year. And then a few years after I, they gave me this, I came up with the idea to put the seventh string on it, and God knows what happened there. <laughs> yeah.